Now, I'm sure you may be wondering, why is a carry player teaching me about wards? Well, if you don't place the wards, I'm gonna be the guy pinging you for not having placed them. Correct. And feeding. So in order to correct that, whatever wards makes him happy, makes me happy. And what wards I don't want to see on the map. So I know what to deward. Exactly. There's a lot to cover, but you're gonna make it easy for me, and I'll make it easy for you. We'll go through chapters, early game. Let's say pole camps, jungle camps, and twin gates. Mid game, we'll cover things like Roshan and taking towers. And late game, I don't know, Brian, what happens late game? We're gonna find out. Let's go ahead and get going. So I think the first and foremost thing we need to worry about in the laning phase is the camps. Okay. Okay, so we gotta make sure that the pull camps, the opponent can't use them too much to take our XP away, and that we have the pull camps available so that you don't have to soak my XP in lane. I like to place a nice little sentry in the bottom left-hand corner of the opponent's big camp. So I like to block the big camp about 80% of the time because if the lane is bad and the opponent's trying to push their advantage, one of the best ways for them to do it is to utilize that big camp to get that extra bolster of XP and it also forces us to walk up here and that whole dynamic as a carry player, that's when the bad situations get really bad. So if we block that camp, not only does that camp block for us, but if the opponent in the pregame mm -hmm. had decided to ward this hill up here, you can do this cute little maneuver where you walk around the low ground and if you walk around the whole circle, you can eventually, as you saw there, see the ward from the low ground and get the D ward. So the goal for the safe lane of either side is to have their small camp available, not blocked, and to have the big camp blocked. So with that sentry, we block, and we usually unblock our own, but if they uh, do manage to block your camp, as you see, this is the whole square that they could block it in, placing a sentry at the very bottom here covers the whole thing, as you can see the radius of the sentry. And it's nice because if they try to get rid of your sentry, it's hard for them to find it in here. Okay, so that's a radiant safe lane. How about dire safe lane? So if we're on dire safe lane, uh, there's no like super hack ward that we can use to get all of that bonus like potential D ward on the cliff. Mm -hmm. But it's really cool that you can use, uh, you can place a ward inside of these crystals on the bottom to block this camp. So it's really hard to see this sentry on the low ground down oh. here. Okay, that's slick. But if you're not too concerned about your small camp, then sometimes it can be better to place it over here on the side or even closer to the lane if the opponent has like an invis hero in the four position role. But in terms of making sure your own small camp is not blocked, it's really nice to place the sentry similar to the concept of down on Radiant, somewhere in the trees over here that's difficult for the opponent to find, but it also covers the entirety of the small camp. So what are the situations which may be rare that I don't want to block the hard camp. Maybe I can use the hard camp. Usually in the early game, the hard camp's purely to your disadvantage. But if you start winning the lane, say you get a few kills, say you're a level or two ahead, and the lane is like consistently pushing into the enemy's tower, mm -hmm. at that point you would want to have access to the pull camp because you generally are trying to push your advantage together. You and your support are trying to be very aggressive. So your support's playing really close to the lane. And it's like inconvenient for them to walk all the way over here or on Radiant to walk like all the way back here. So that's when the big camp would come to your advantage. And at that point, even if you sentry blocked it, you can just kill the sentry. Right. Um, if you feel like you want to unblock it earlier than that. Okay, that covers side lanes, but mid laners, they're pretty dependent on vision as well. Observer wards last for six minutes these days. Yes. And sentries last for seven. So around five minutes is when it turns to nighttime, which is also about the time that observer wards will start dying. So what is a mid laner to do at nighttime? So as you can see, if we look at the daytime, I can see all the way across the river. I can see a long ways threats like the four position trying to gank me. But once it hits nighttime, I don't have any of that information anymore. Mm -hmm. So what that means is at nighttime, if either team has information, it's almost always a ward. And so it's even more important that when that nighttime hits that you're the first one to place that ward. Because if I place my ward first and he decides to place his ward You'll afterwards, see I'll see him placing it, but he will not have seen me placing my ward. So with that in mind, if I think I'm the first one placing, then I'll usually not carry a sentry with me as the mid laner. But if I think I'm the second one placing it, I like to place a sentry somewhere in the river that protects any sentries that might deward my ward. 
but also might clip their ward on their side. So a few common wards, like if you have two sentries, like one from you, one from your support, we usually like to place one somewhere down here that will catch like the entire ridge mm -hmm. with the circle. And then you basically want to be able to cover as much of the ridges as possible because these are the spots that see the runes. They see across the river as well. That's like the importance of seeing where the enemy mid is. And so if you see the circles over, like, uh, overlapping here, these are usually about where the two sentries will want to be, um, which we'll see all the way up here to clip these wards and these wards on this side, and then also catching the wards on this side, protecting your own. And this is like usually a battle for who gets this set up first. And if you feel like they are, if they already showed you where their sentries are, because they de-warded yours, then you can maybe place it a bit more confidently like to look for an observer ward. So usually if you have the high ground ward, you want it to ideally clip the rune. Okay. So if you see here like that very edge, we'll see this illusion rune down here. And it's even more important that since you get this done at five minutes that the first power rune comes out at six minutes. So usually Radiant will go for this one. And since Dire, um, it's like a bit more of an open area up here, a lot of Dire teams will go for this ward that barely clips this rune. So these are like the greedy wards, meaning that they still see across the cliff. Uh, you know, you see this ward sees all the way up here. This ward sees all the way up here. But these are also the easiest to deward because they get caught by these sentries. So a lot of times at the pro level, people will either place it right in the middle so that maybe these sentries over here miss it. Mm -hmm. um, or they'll place it like all the way up here so that the sentries in the middle at all don't catch it, but it does still see the rune. So think of it as like, this gives you the most information, but it's also the most likely to get dewarded. You have to kind of bargain, you know, which one's worth it, more information or the likelihood of getting dewarded. So enough talk about the mid laners, because okay. we know who the MVP of the game is. And that's gonna be the carry players, right? <laughs> and at this point in the game, the first night times hit, I'm starting to hit the jungle creeps. Okay. And so this patch with the new camps that are like on the sides of the map, these have become really popular for carries. First and foremost, because these two camps are like retreating from the lane rather than like advancing towards the opponent with these two camps. Mm -hmm. So carriers will most often find themselves farming right here in the like five to 10 minute mark. Plus so I, what, I know you love that buff that comes with these camps Oh, also. the buff is all the way back here. Oh. But right when the laning stage ends, right when the nighttime hits around five minutes, these two camps are what I'm keeping my eye on. Okay. And so the thing we gotta be very careful of is the ganks coming from the twin gate on both sides, right? Cause the twin gates right next to these two camps on Dire, mm -hmm. And it's also right next to these two camps on Radiant. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. Do we actually have water? Yes, I have a pitcher. You can drink straight out of it. Oh yeah, this is ghetto. So if we are concerned about getting ganked as a carry, it's important first to consider, do we have a defensive ward on our own twin gate to see that the enemy support's coming through? Wait, you're advocating that I should ward my own twin gate? I can do that myself if okay. I'm a carry. So that's something where if you're very concerned about it and you see three wards in stock as a carry, they're free, okay. might as well buy them. We wanna make sure that they don't see us down here. So having a ward in a sentry, something along the lines of down here is super nice on your own twin gate. Now, if you're thinking you wanna invade the opponent, mm -hmm. it's equally valuable to have these wards on their side. For instance, I'm just radiant with these wards. I can now see the dire carry farming this camp. The basics of this is that we wanna, at the very least, ensure that they don't have a ward on our twin gate seeing your carry farm. Okay. And if you want to go for the extra invasion, you can do that to them. Okay. And then show me on Radiant if you don't mind. It's basically the same ward, but you can either place this one, but you can see that it doesn't see the camps. Right. So if you're looking to invade as Dire, you maybe want to place the ward right here where it can see anybody from Radiant entering the Twin Gate, mm. but it would also see the camps. So like if you place the one on the high ground as the invader, it wouldn't actually do much for you in regards to seeing what they're up to. But if you're Radiant trying to defend your carry, this ward up here is gonna be very nice just to see, cause you'll be able to see the animation of the person coming through the twin, twin gate. Right. With a sentry usually on the low ground here or on the low ground here. What percentage of games would you say that these twin gate wards are pretty critical? I would say that if the enemy five has roaming potential, which right now there's a lot of like vengeful spirits mm -hmm. and such and banes. So I would say probably over 50% of games I'm okay. looking to think, but if it's like a passive five, something like a warlock, then I'm less concerned about this happening. And lucky for you guys, we've actually got the hard evidence provided by the SAP cloud showing just what the most popular wards are during the early game. These are some of the most popular wards placed before four minutes in the bottom lane. The middle lane.
and the top line. Okay, I feel pretty confident on early game then, making sure the carry is protected in the laning phase, but towers start to go down, and I'm panicking, Brian. Everything that I thought was safe is no longer safe anymore, so what do I do in the mid game? Yeah, over time in Dota, the map kind of, it evolves, right? What becomes safe, what becomes dangerous, and so at usually around 10 minutes, both teams' tier one safe lane has dropped. That's usually the most common tower that goes down. So if we're looking from the Dyer's perspective right now, invading Radiant, we've now taken this tower and we're thinking we either want to invade the Carry's farm this way because they've backed up into these camps because they're scared of these camps now mm -hmm. because the tower's dead, or they're going to retreat more into their woods and we want to proceed to invade their mid-tier one tower, right? So when we're thinking about from Radiant's side, we want to protect these objectives at all costs, whether we're more afraid of our Carry getting ganked or whether or not we're more afraid of our mid-tower getting dove. So if we're more afraid of our mid tower, a really nice defensive ward is right here because it covers pretty much all of the paths that they could be coming from in order to get there, the low ground as well as the high ground. If we're looking to protect our carry, then this cliff ward is one of the most reliable wards out there. It gives them all the information they would ever need. And at the very least, you know, they have the tower for the lane and the ward for everything else. And these are kind of applicable to both teams. Well, for all the things that you just said, if I'm dire, and I want to either push mid or find the carry, same ward spots. If we're looking from Dyer's perspective, we want to protect our mid tower. A lot of times the ward will either be placed up here to see their path going that way, or it'll be up here to see them flanking from the lane. So usually what people will do is they'll push the lane in, they'll farm the lane, and then they'll rotate on the tower. So they're often coming from this direction. It's the same idea as them coming from Radiant. And that's why this ward will almost always catch them. Um, and at the same time, if you want to protect your Dyer carry, then it's the same thing on this cliff up here, where this, this ward catches all the paths that they could possibly find your carry um, while they're jungling. So you don't mind if I put it on a cliff then? Even though it's a hot spot, people know that it's gonna be up there. The thing is the cliffs are OP wards for a reason, right? They give you so much information. So a lot of times it's not about necessarily if the ward stays alive. If I'm the carry and I'm up here and I survive a gank because of this ward, even if the opponent knows that I saw them and they end up dewarding the ward, then saving my carry's life one time is worth it in the grand scheme of things. So yes, it's not necessarily, you know, just place wards on cliffs all the time. There's plenty of places that you can be wasting your wards. It's really important to know that these are more defensive wards. If you're on the radiant side trying to invade, these same defensive wards are really nice as offensive wards, right. where you can see the carry up here and you can also see them rotating between the jungle and lane with this ward. So a lot of the wards in my experience have been whether it's Radiant or Dyer placing them, they're in similar places. It's just that if Dyer's placing them up here, they're defensive. Mm -hmm. If Radiant's placing them up here, they're offensive. Okay, this cover is, I guess, getting close to sieging tier twos. But there are a couple of camps on this new map that are kind of in the middle of nowhere. What if I want to see the famed triangle, which used to be so popular to catch carries. Yeah, absolutely. So sometimes your off lane tends to lose, right? And also the enemy is trying to invade like a Medusa or a Sven or a Luna that's trying to farm a lot of these ancient camps. So if you're Radiant, the most important thing is that since you have this watcher covering this area, that we need to be able to see them coming from the other direction. So this high ground ward is very good for that. Um, that's basically the nice defensive ward that allows you to get out safely if you see the opponent coming. But it's equally good as an aggressive ward because it clips the ancient camp over here. So if I see that the opponent's been stacking, I'll know that they're going to go farm it with this ward. Mm -hmm. So this is a defensive ward for Radiant, an offensive ward for Dire. But if stacks are a big part of the game for your team, these wards are going to be absolutely essential because this is where most of the stacks happen. And you'll see in professional Dota, teams will be bringing four to five heroes each in order to contest stacks. And if having ward vision of this will decide who wins the fight. And same thing for Dire, um, but on Dire, the, uh, the Watcher is over here. So this, this hill is equally as important, but if you are concerned about them dewarding it, sometimes you can place it on the side here so that it's less likely to get clipped by a sentry, but you still have all the information of both the ramps from this watcher as well as from the ward. I'm glad to see that you're also incorporating watcher vision into things. Oh, the watchers are, they're kind of the same idea as like a, a ward that gets dewarded. Like the enemy is gonna walk through the watcher. Usually they'll notice that <laughs> The watcher's taken. Assuming the game isn't bugged. <laughs> Assuming. And they will just quickly remove it, right? But at the same time, you knew they were there. 
And that's exactly how I view watchers as basically a ward that gets dewarded every time they walk past it. All right, but these are obvious, Brian. I see the cliff, I see the eyeball icon on it. At higher level games, that doesn't fly, man. So tell me, what do you see in your games when there's this cat and mouse game of wards and dewards? Yeah, there's kind of like this progressive meta of where these dewards happen. So a lot of times people start it off by placing a sentry on this high ground, it briefly gives vision, you see the ward, and it gets dewarded. Okay. Now, so the first step of the evolution of warding is that if this sentry gets placed on the high ground, we see the ring of it and people will start placing wards barely outside of it. So like wards will start happening over here, you know, they'll start happening over here on the very side. So people got smarter because they were missing the wards on the low ground. So what would happen is we'll actually place a sentry that barely clips the high ground, as you can see when we place it like right here, then they use something like a courier of an observer ward or an ability that gets vision on it and then kills it. So people will start placing wards that are outside the radius of this sentry. Oh, we got so, more layers. So we end up with like a ward in the middle of the lane or a ward all the way up here, right? Where these common sentry D wards are happening. But eventually does it all cycle back then that you eventually become okay putting it on the cliff and calling it a day? Well, what you see here is that I've taken a lot of time to deliberately show you where they're gonna place the sentry, how far away it has to be to place this ward. Your support, you're watching your carry farm. You're like, okay, let's make sure we place the sentry here. But sometimes you're in the heat of the moment, you're in a team fight, things are about to happen. Things are of, time is of the essence. Mm -hmm. That ward, I don't care if it lasts for 10 seconds, but if it gives us that vision for a gank, for a team fight, it can be a game changer. So you'll see sometimes where teams will smoke, they'll place a ward on the hill just for the sake of a team fight. And half the time, the supports will be spending the fight fighting over that ward spot on the high ground rather than actually clicking their abilities on enemies. And you mentioned smokes. I know specifically smokes at nighttime and the vision provided in these moments. That's another situation where you're saying time is of the essence. The second the smoke breaks, what do I do as a support? So what happens is that in nighttime, hero vision is usually only 800, most heroes. But smoke breaks at a range of 1,025. So if you are walking with your heroes at nighttime and you don't have a ward on you and your smoke breaks, you will not see the enemy that broke your smoke. Mm -hmm. So if you are going to smoke at nighttime, it is absolutely essential that you have a ward looking to ward cliffs that you're trying to invade but if you do have your smoke break, usually just planting a ward on the ground if there isn't a cliff available is ample enough to like do the job of finding the hero that broke your smoke. So as you see here, we're gonna be smoked and there's gonna be a dazzle down here and our smoke is gonna break, but we don't see him yet. So sometimes since we're not close enough to the hill, we can just plop a ward on the, on the low ground. But maybe if you have an ether lens or maybe you're a hero with mobility, you'll be able to make your way all the way up here to get that like extra vision. But when it comes down to smokes, it's all about surprising them, not giving them time to react. A word like this that just shows you the enemy hero, allowing you to blink initiate onto them will be good enough to make the smoke successful. All right, I feel pretty confident on towers then, but that's just one objective out of many objectives these days, specifically Roche. Roche used to be so easy to ward. Just one cliff on either side on Radiant and Dire. Now I don't really know what to do when I want to get vision of the pit. Well, we can go right back to what we learned at five minutes because the Roche is in two different places, but how are they connected? The, the twin, twin gate. gate. Yes, jinx. <laughs> so what happens is it's absolutely essential, whether it's on Radiant or on Dire, to place high ground vision if you're the first ones to get there. This is the absolute like god tier ward, the equivalent of the cliff wards, but it's even more OP because of the advantage that high ground offers you in such a tight area, right? There's small ramps, there's very limited mobility around here, and this is like god vision if you're the team that gets there first. Now, the question we have is that it applies on both Radiant and Dire that we have this high ground warded. What happens if the other team is the one that gets there first? Mm -hmm. How do we ever break this high ground? And that is a problem that pro players often deal with. So something we have to consider is that since this is the best ward, you can almost always assume the opponent wants to place this one that the best option to gain the hill back is to actually flank them. So say Dyer is trying to take the hill from Radiant who already controls this. They'll place a ward something like over here while they're in smoke, and then they'll go all the way around while in smoke to flank. Oh, all the way, all Yeah, the way. they will do an entire lap because what happens is if you do this lap and you force the opponent to retreat away from the hill because mm. they want to stay on the high ground, if they ever do retreat with the supports to try to stay in the back, the ward you previously placed 
will catch them. So it's the same concept if you're trying to invade while you're radiant and the die hair has already taken this hill, that they will usually smoke up, they'll place a ward, and then they'll walk all the way around doing the exact same thing where you don't want to break your smoke on the people that are on the cliff, so you can't take this path. You have to go all uh, the way around. Okay. If you walk through this area, your smoke will break on top of their ward. They see you and they die. Mm -hmm. So it's absolutely essential to have patience when it comes to this. It's a bit of a process, but if you can get your team to do this maneuver, it's one of the most common maneuvers for the team that is at the disadvantage and the other team holds control of the area. That's great stuff, Brian. But SAP has even better stuff as they've got some data showing what's popular as far as mid-game warding is concerned. Here are the most popular wards placed between 10 to 15 minutes in the Radiant Jungle. and the Dire Jungle. And these are the most popular wards seen near the Twin Gate at the bottom of the map, and the top of the map. Okay, I've checked all my boxes then. We've taken out our towers. I've theoretically got Roche. What's the next step? So the next step is figuring out how to go through the ever elusive high ground okay. of the opponent. So when we're looking at sieging tier threes, it's absolutely essential that we have as much information as possible because the high ground is such a significant disadvantage. So if we press alt, we can see that the towers see most of their base, but it does not see this cute little area in the middle here. So a lot of teams on the offen offensive will try to place an invasive ward right on the cliff like this, where they can place it from the low ground, they can jump anybody who's looking to defend their tier three on either mid or side lane, and this is an absolute like game-winning ward if it's allowed to happen. You place a sentry right in the middle on this side or in the middle on this side to make sure that the opponent does not have this ward. And it's a very common maneuver for the opponent to smoke for this exact ward because they smoke, they place the ward, they see you in base, they jump you. So having this sentry here ahead of time will see that ward get dropped. You'll know that the opponent is smoked and making sure that they don't allow that. That kill will give them the ability to go high ground. And so this is like the same thing as the high ground wards on the cliffs where this is the most common ward, but people have caught on. So instead of always going for the god tier ward, sometimes it's better to go for the ward that's less likely to get dewarded. So a lot of teams will go for a ward on the side here, as you see, it's barely outside of the tower range, oh, yeah. and they will place that ward to see just as much information in regards to jumping the person defending the tower, but you don't get to see the entire picture of the opponent's base. Okay, how about a dire team sieging Radiant High Ground? You got any sneaky wards for me there? When you're dire invading, it's not as good of a ward because there's trees blocking, but it's the same concept as the ward that's in the middle because the wards that are placed here between the towers are the exact same mm -hmm. on both sides. You can place a sentry if you're Radiant trying to defend, as the opponent will usually try to place the ward somewhere right around here, and so these sentries are still the best sentries. But looking for the, as you see here, the wards on the side here are not very useful for sieging Radiant. So these wards are even more essential for Radiant to deward because there's no real equivalent of them um, if Dyer is trying to invade. Mm -hmm. But if you want to on the side of Dyer, you can also place a ward here that at least will see if anybody's camping in the trees on the side, but not nearly as good as the counter ward that's up here. Okay, I know how to deward when the enemy is sieging me, but what if I want to see things and I'm the defending team? So at daytime, your towers are going to give you ample vision of what's happening around you. I have total, complete knowledge if there's anybody outside my base, unless they are smoked. But at nighttime, that is absolutely not the case. So a lot of teams that are defending at nighttime, they'll place a ward right on the ramp of whatever lane is getting sieged so that they can see anybody that's out here before they get there. Because the tower is already giving you the true sight, it's already giving you the effective sentry. You just need that ward vision to feel a bit extra safer in your, in your base. But if it's daytime, I don't think there's really any other wards that you need. Your base provides you with all the information. So if I'm getting sieged, definitely pay attention to the clock, see if I have day or nighttime vision, and then something that Maybe an absolutely ridiculous ward in the daytime is critical at nighttime. Absolutely. After all is said and done, a successful tier 3 siege, but we didn't necessarily take the full lane. What happens next? So usually the team that's on the offensive should use a sentry on the tier 3 that they just killed. This will make sure that if the opponent does have a ward, such as the one that 
a lot of teams will commonly place when they are defending that they don't have that anymore. And if they don't have that ward, you can place a ward in the middle of the lane. You can try to replace a ward over here, but those usually get dewarded already anyways. Mm -hmm. And so that's something where if you're going to retreat, it's absolutely essential that you know if the opponent's going to follow you. So the offensive team, in this case the Dazzle, he'll place the ward on the ground here. But if these wards feel like they're getting dewarded a lot, then a lot of times all you really care about is if the opponent is going to leave their base. Right? So lane wards become very popular at this stage in the game. Lane wards, something like this that sees mid lane, or something all the way up here that sees the side lanes um, on both sides. And this just makes it so that our single goal, if we're not going to go high ground and end the game, is that we see the opponent trying to leave their base. Okay. So even though it's not helping for the siege, because probably those high ground wards are going to get dewarded anyway, you just want to know who's leaving the map, where they're going, when they left. Yeah, the entire goal of our wards throughout the entire game has been like, what is the opponent's objective? What is the likely path that they're going to take? You know, early we talked about they're going to try to take our tier one tower. They're going to try to gank our carry. At this stage of the game, the team that's defending high ground, their sole mission is going to be to get out of base. Mm -hmm. So all of our wards on the offensive should be about how do we make sure that we cover all of their escape paths, basically. Now, if you're the team that's on the defensive, if you're looking to leave your base, it's almost always essential that you smoke out, okay. right? Because these wards are going to happen very often. And if you're going to smoke out, we come back to the ganks, the team fights, where a lot of smokes will just be used to get high ground vision like this. You smoke out a base, you place a high ground ward, and this basically advances your base effectively from here all the way to this high ground. And you still treat this like your base in the sense that you're defending this high ground as if you were defending a tier three tower where you place a ward down, you place a sentry, and you wanna make sure that what this does is instead of getting trapped in your base and having no farm, you now have access to a couple camps. And if the opponent tries to engage you, you have the exact advantage that you would have had if you were sitting inside of your base. Time has passed. We don't have control of the enemy lanes, at least that close to their base anymore. So now where do I put the wards? On well, the late game, since all the towers are dead, there's only one place to go in terms of an objective, which is their base. Sometimes that's just not feasible. So the only thing on the map that we can actually treat like objectives that we know the opponent has to do is farming creep waves. They have to push the lanes in in order to take our base. So if we want to ward objectives, the late game is actually all about warding the lanes to see that the people are going to farm them before they get there. So in this case, a lot very common ward, for example, in the mid lane, would be that we would place a ward that sees the opponent about to farm the creep wave, and they're gonna walk up to farm our creep wave. We see it coming, it's like a moving objective for them. Ignore that. <laughs> So the, they'll be walking up to farm the creep wave, and this is going to allow us to get the jump on them with the advantage of the vision because we know they're coming. A lot of times people will only try to show on the creep waves for a split second or two because a lot of heroes at the stage of the game have cleave or really high damage nukes. So it's absolutely essential that we see them coming before they get to the creep wave, just like you'd want to see them before they're sieging your base. And the same applies for the side lanes as well. Placing wards anywhere in the lane before they meet the creeps or even on the high grounds that see them about to get there on the lanes. These are very common late game wards. It's hard to get a handle on the late game, Brian, but SAP's got us covered yet again. Take a look at the most popular wards in the late game. Here's a couple of the most popular wards seen during high ground pushes. and some of the wards you might be seeing after 40 minutes. Great, well I think that just about covers it. I appreciate it, BSJ, SAP, and YOU. I hope you learned something. Mid game, we can start to cover things like Roche and Towers. And late game, I have no idea. Let's find out with you. I have no idea either. <laughs> <laughs>